Hello, everybody. Uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is uh, Matt De La Cruz, General Manager for Rayco Rents. Uh, I'd like to thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to join us for our webinar, Intro to PIDs for Gas Detection Applications. Our presenter today is Tom Kochevar. In this 45-minute webinar, he will cover the following. What is a photoionization detector? What does it measure? How does a PID differ from an LEL sensor? Why would I use one over the other? Why does the photon energy of a PID lamp matter? Where would I use a 9.8 EV, a 10.6 EV, or 11.7 EV lamp? What is a correction factor? And how do I determine the reading of a mixture? And then at the end, we'll do a Ask the Expert. We'll answer your question. Tom has been working in the field of gas detection and safety since 1996. He currently serves as Midwest Regional Sales Manager at Honeywell Ray Systems Division, focusing on portable and wireless projects. His 10-state territory includes a variety of mark markets, manufacturing, oil and gas, chemical, and fire and hazmat industries. We welcome Tom back as a speaker and thank him for sharing his knowledge during this exclusive session for our customers. Welcome. Thanks, Matt. Good afternoon, everyone. I apologize, I'm feeling a little under the weather right now, so if I sound like I'm a little muffled, I am. Just a little seasonal allergies and coming off of a cold, I suppose. But today what we're gonna do is we're gonna talk about uh, an intro to PIDs and what exactly a PID is. I'm gonna try to keep this fun and exciting for everybody. Uh, I'll have some silly anecdotes and stories from the field. Uh, and if anybody has any questions, please, by any means, uh, you can go ahead and email and we'll answer them after the session. But the first thing we're going to talk about is what is exactly a PID. A PID stands for photoionization detector. It detects VOCs, or volatile organic compounds, and toxic gases from about 10 ppb to about 10,000 parts per million. A PID is a very sensitive broad spectrum monitor, like a low-level LEL monitor. So uh, we're going to talk about it later, but we'll talk about the differences between <coughs> an LEL and a PID. Anyone involved with the use of chemicals, gases, and petroleum products like environmental, IH, safety, hazmat response, and maintenance operations um, are usually involved with uh, dealing with PIDs and volatile organic compounds. Um, a PID is like a magnifying glass that lets a detective see fingerprints. A PID lets us see the VOCs. So it's amazing the age-old argument behind um, what an LEL sensor is and uh, having a PID, like when I go to firehouses, uh, people say to me, I don't need a PID, I don't want to spend the money, or uh, you know, if I can smell something, that's good enough for me. Um, they couldn't be further from the truth because if you're on the news and you're talking to someone, you're talking to Channel 2 or Channel 5 News, and your monitor says, I've got 600, uh, on, I got 600 PPM reading on my VOC channel, um, a person can say, well, what is it? Well, it smells like gasoline. Well, usually if it smells like something or walks like something, it usually is. So in this case, it would be gasoline. But the point is that 600 ppm gasoline on your PID doesn't even register on your LEL sensor, and we'll talk about that in the future. Most gases have a specific ionization potential, or an IP, measured in electronic voltage. An ultraviolet lamp ionizes a sample gas which causes it to electronically charge. If the IP of the gas is less than the electronic voltage of the output of the lamp, it will be ionized. If it's higher than the EV or what the lamp is rated, it's just gonna pass on through, so it will not ionize. <coughs> the sensor detects the charge of the ionized gas and converts the signal into a current. The current then is amplified and displayed on the meter as in PPM or in parts per billion. So in this picture, you're gonna see, you're gonna see gas enters inside the instrument and it passes by the UV lamp. When it becomes ionized, you'll notice that it gets separated. In the real world, what I usually tell people is there's like a little mini explosion or a poop that happens. So as the ionization, as the particles ionize, you'll have that electric current that shows up as charged gas ions, and then it is measured by the monitor itself, just that electric current, 
and then when it leaves the chamber, it comes back together. So in other words, if you have gasoline on the left-hand side, it passes by the lamp, it creates a little proof or a little mini explosion. It's not dangerous by any means, but it just gets ionized. An electronic charge is produced. That electronic charge is measured uh, electronically, and then whoop, it comes back together and it comes out of the chamber as gasoline again. So that's why a lot of people in hazmat or in the industrial hygiene world, they'll use uh, a tether bag and they'll hook up the tether bag to the PID and they'll measure what's going on. And in the exhaust port of the PID, they'll actually save it in a tether bag. And within 24 hours, you can actually do your uh, analysis from your tether bag at a third party a location if you choose to. So remember, it's a non-disruptive way of measuring gas. When you're using an LEL sensor, you're actually burning a sample and that burning is being measured. In a PID, the, electro the electronic charge or voltage gets measured and then the, uh, the, the VOC comes back as normal, like I said in my gas analogy. Pretty interesting graphics there, huh? The IP, what is an ion, the ionization potential? The IP determines if the PID can actually see the gas or not. This is very important. If the IP of the gas is less than the EV output of the lamp, it will be able to see it. In other words, if you have, let's say for instance, let's pick on, let's pick on acetone, okay? According to my Tech Note 106, uh, the EV is 9.71. I would say 85 to 90% of the monitors that we sell have 10.6 lamps. A lot of our com competition have 10.6 lamps too. So you're going to be able to ionize the acetone in that particular sample. The ionization potential does not correlate with the correction factor. It's totally different. Okay. When you have isobutylene, which is the uh, which has a correction factor of 1.0. So on an isobutylene scale, all of the VOCs, not all of them, but a good majority that are in a NIOSH pocket guide or even in Tech Note 106 will have a measurement or an EV so that you can quickly determine that if this particular VOC has the ability to be ionized with the particular lamp that you have. In this case with acetone, we have a 10.6 lamp. Acetone is 9.71. So it's lower than 10.6, it will ionize. The correction factor on a 1.0 scale for acetone is 1.1. So if your monitor is reading 10 and you have it in isobutylene units, you take 1.1, you times it by 10, which comes to be 11. So it's very simple math if you use it by you know, base 10. So if you, that's, it's easy for me to use that way to explain how a correction factor is. <laughs> If the, it, you have to look at it as you have to look at the lamps, the 9.8 to 10.6 and the 11.7 as wattage of gas lamps. If the wattage of the gas or vapor is less than the wattage of the PID lamp, then the PID can see the gas or vapor. Again, if we had a 9.8 lamp inside that monitor, it would be able to recognize a 9.71 EV. Okay, but in the case of uh, let's see, let's pick on, let's pick on hydrofluoric acid. Hydrofluoric acid EV is 15.2. Hydrofluoric acid, it will enter the chamber and not ionize and come back out the exhaust port as hydrofluoric acid. It'll still read 0, 0.0. So it's very important that you understand what the, the, you know, what the environment that you're looking at and what your VOCs are. This grade is actually pretty interesting. It just talks about the basics of what the difference is or why you would use different types of lamps. If you're looking at something that has a uh, very low EV like styrene, benzene, or MEK, um, I wouldn't go with a 10.6. I'd go with a 9.8 lamp. Why? Because it's under 9.8. You would get interferences if you have like a mixture, especially and you're looking for uh, benzene or styrene. If you have a 10.6 lamp, it's just going to pass on by. So you really just don't want to be interfered by the higher EV for like the 9.8 lamp. In the second case with the 10.6 EV lamp, it's a little bit broader. 
So you'll be able to see both styrene and benzene, but you'll be able to see the ethylene and you'll also see the vinyl chloride as well as like ammonia. So it's very important that you, you see that, that you be able to see what you, what you get in the spectrum of the 9.8 or the 10.6. And then of course you have the 11 sevenths. Now the thing about 11.7, it's a tricky, this is a tricky one because 11 seven lamps only have a 30 day warranty. Why? And that's because the crystal or the flat part of the, of the uh, lamp is not sonically welded like the 10.6 or the 9.8, it's actually glued. So there's gas inside uh, the lamps on the inside, which in this case would be acetone, not acetone, you know, um, argon, argon gas. And <laughs> the, the, the worst thing that can happen to a PID probably will be uh, you know, like high humidity or high temperatures that can affect the lamp and actually microscopically warp that lamp. If it warps, if it warps that top of the lamp, it'll break the seal and the lamp will be, you know, the, the lamp will burn out. Not ionizing, you know, if you look at the far right, you see non-ionizable, uh, <laughs> sorry I said that, uh, carbon monoxide, oxygen, uh, and a lot of acids. I'd probably say about 95, 96% of acids do not do not ionize. Uh, acetic acid does, but it has a very high uh, correction factor, high EV rate. So you'll see that if you look at Techno 106. Now, different VOCs like organic compounds uh, containing carbons, like aromatics, compounds containing a benzene ring, like benzene, ethyl benzene, toluene, xylene. Uh, these are very common for uh, to be measured with a PID. Ketones and aldehyde uh, compounds with CO and O2 uh, O bonds or oxygen bonds like acetone, MEK. Uh, it's very interesting that these compounds uh, will light up a PID faster than you know. It's it, these they have low uh, EVs and are very sensitive. <coughs> They're very sensitive to a PID. Amines and amides. Uh, carbon uh, compounds contain nitrogen, uh, chlorinated hydrocarbons, sulfur compounds, unsaturated hydrocarbons, alcohols also, and saturated hydro hydrocarbons like butane and octane. So like gas, my, my example with gasoline, people will measure gasoline with a PID better than with just using uh, an LEL sensor. Inorganic compounds without carbon molecules like uh, ammonia and semiconductor gases like arsine, uh, they will ionize, but they have a high correction factor. So if you use like a four gas with a PID monitor, I would check with your manufacturer. Uh, in particular, like Ray Systems, its correction factor for ammonia is 32.2. I'm not familiar with you know other manufacturers, but I certainly would consult with their technicians and find out because uh, I notice a lot in in food manufacturing, as well as firefighting, when you're dealing with uh, cooling agents like ice rinks, uh, ammonia is very, very important because a lot of people's uh, ammonia sensors will top out at anywhere from 100 to 300 parts per million. If you want to get higher than that, you have to go to a PID. So here's another just quick, <coughs> here's another quick uh, list of units or particular uh, gases that will not be measured. Uh, you cannot measure radiation. You cannot measure uh, suspicious white uh, powder. Like after 9-11, there was a rash of uh, mail bombings and uh, suspicious mails and letters with white powder. You cannot do uh, nitrogen, oxygen, uh, CO2, uh, water molecules. Actually, water molecules will ionize, but for different reasons because they're actually, it's, uh, there's a phenomenon inside the PID that when uh, maybe steam gets inside there, it actually will skip across the lamp. Again, that's a, day for, a story for another day. As I mentioned before, acids don't ionize very well. Natural gas, this is a very, very important, I took a phone call on Monday about this one and got into an argument with somebody. Natural gas in, their, in its natural state without the methyl mercaptan will not ionize. And it's, again, this is another long story but the stinky stuff, methyl mercaptan, will ionize. So when you go up to a gas leak and you have a PID, the only chance of you getting a hit on your PID will be is if you have a VOC present or if you can smell the methyl mercaptan. So it's very important that you understand 
the difference between looking at natural gas and methyl mercaptan. This is probably, I get this question probably about once every four to six weeks. Why not always use an 11.7 lamp? The 9.8 and 10.6 provide the most sensitivity. And what this means is that you're closer to 9.8 or the 10.6, and it gives you better reliability with the lamp versus the 11.7. The, the 10.6 lamp in the, in the half inch uh, lamp has a three year warranty or 36 month warranty. <laughs> it's very important that you understand that because, it, again, picture a, a, a beer bottle, uh, an upside down beer bottle. The flat part of the beer bottle is your lamp, okay, or is your crystal. And the bottom part of the beer bottle, or that flat part, that flat pad of the flat plate of the glass, is sonically welded to the rest of the beer bottle. In an 11 7 lamp, it's glued. So when the glue gives way, to the pressure inside the uh, inside the bottle, it'll microscopically warp and then poof, your lamp is burned out. So the 10.6 and the 11, uh, the 10.6 and the 9.8 lamps are sonically welded. Now this is an old price, but the 10.6 lamp is probably about 295 now, so I apologize for that price discrepancy. The 11.7 lamp requires uh, required for higher energy compounds like uh, methylene chloride. Uh, formaldehyde, I know people use formaldehyde with 11.7 lamps, um, but remember the 11.7 lamp only has a 30-day warranty. Sometimes they last three months, sometimes they last a year, it just depends on how you store it. Again, uh, daylight, temperature, humidity all affect the 11.7 lamp. <clears throat> I have turned down orders for 11.7 lamps because People were going to be waiting too long to install the 11.7 lamp, which means that they wouldn't insert them into their monitor for at least 30 days. They basically would be wasting their money. So they usually will order an 11.7 lamp when it's time to use it. And they'll use it and they'll charge the customer. It's customary to charge the customer as part of your fee when you go out to a customer and you're doing an investigation with an 11.7 lamp. It's just it's a casualty of war as far as I'm concerned. Uh, PIDs are very sensitive and accurate, yet they're, they're very selective. And this slide, these series of slides are very important for people to understand. <coughs> the, in this case, the ruler cannot differentiate between the yellow paper and the white paper. The PID cannot differentiate between ammonia and xylene. What does that mean? It'll tell you something is present, but it won't tell you what it is. It's not the start, you know, it's not the tricorder from Star Trek. It's, uh, it's not a, it's not a, a GC or a gas chromatograph. It won't tell you what it is. It will tell you something's present. But if you can smell the xylene, chances are it is xylene. Um, if you can, if you can feel, if you can feel or you can, uh, smell ammonia, <clears throat> it's going to tell you, it's, it's, it's going to give you a readout, but it will not tell you it's ammonia. Again, what is the correction factor? The correction factors are the key to unlocking the power of the PID for assessing varying mixtures and unknown environments. The correction factor is a measure of the sensitivity of the PID to a specific gas. Correction factors are scaling factors that do not make a PID specific to a chemical. They are only <coughs> correct to the schedule of that, con of that chemical. So as I mentioned before, Correction factors are based on the, on the table of isobutylene, which is 1.0. Correction factors also uh, allow calibration on cheap non-toxic surrogate, uh, surrogate gases. Again, uh, we have our Technote 106, which is basically our viable and race system. It's very important for people to understand. You might say, <clears throat> you might say well, my particular monitor has 300 uh, different correction factors. Mine has 250. It doesn't matter because in most cases, people will switch from isobutylene to acetone. And then what will happen is you want to measure something in acetone, so you're, you're, just taking the, you're just taking the scale and moving it over to that, ice, to that acetone scale, which would be 1.1. <coughs> but a lot of people forget. I'm, I'm losing my voice now. I'm sorry. A lot of people will... Um, 
forget that they changed the correction factor. So then they go on their second assignment and they want to measure MEK, but they forget to go with the, uh, they, they forgot that they changed their unit from isobutylene to acetone units. And they're trying to measure MEK in acetone units, which is virtually impossible. So again, I usually tell people about every about 90 to 95% of the applications I have out there, they keep them in the isobutylene units and they choose to do the math themselves. But if you're in a manufacturing process, like a, for, uh, for instance, like a, uh, a glue factory, where you're gonna be working with acetone and MMA, you would be able to uh, change the correction factor to that particular VOC and measure it one-to-one. -one. Low correction factors equals high PID sensitive, uh, sensitivity to a gas. So, if I tell you that an EV is 9.07, I can tell you immediately that it's gonna get a hit with your monitor, especially with a 10.6 lamp. If the chemical is bad for you, then a PID needs to be sensitive to it. <coughs> if the chemical isn't too bad, then a PID doesn't need to be a sensitive uh, uh, for that particular application. I was on the south side of Chicago at a glue factory where they were changing out the vats probably six to seven times a day and they had their men poking their heads inside the vat while they were cleaning it. The two main chemicals that they were using were acetone and methyl uh, methacrylate or MMA. And what's important is you need to understand those two particular chemicals. The TWA for acetone is 500. The TWA for, meth or for MMA is 100 parts per million. So as you can tell, the units of measurement with a PID are so much more finite with a PID than an LEL sensor that in most cases, uh, we told the customer that they were putting their workers in harm's way and we recommended uh, a good respiratory program so that they could go home safely every night pretty much. And they agreed because they were using uh, cartridge respirator, or negative, uh, negative respirators, full face cartridges, and they were having breakthroughs probably in less than eight minutes. And I said, you, you got to go to airline because uh, I wouldn't know that information if it wasn't for my PIDs that were blasting off in the space every time that I was working with this customer. So the customer relented <coughs> and they went with the, with an airline respirator system and immediately the customer and their workers were uh, much more healthy and seemed more positive about that particular work or that particular uh, assignment for their workers. So in this case, a PID really was very helpful for um, that customer. In this case, Tylee's correction factor with a 10.6 lamp is 0.5. So a PID is very sensitive to Tylee, very similar to what my example was just then. If a PID reads 100 and I sub units, uh, then the correction factor, <clears throat> which is 0.5, is you're reading technically in 50 ppm in telluline units. Now, on the contrary, with ammonia with a 10.6 lamp, its correction factor is 9.7. I usually rank it up to, I usually move it up to about 10.0. If a PID reads uh, 100 in isobutylene units, 10 times 100 is a thousand parts per million, roughly, I should say. So I hope that this example, or these two examples are great for you to understand the differences between using correction factors and using just the isobutylene scale. <clears throat> this is what a PID lamp looks like. Remember the upside down beer bottle analogy I gave you earlier. The internal contamination, <clears throat> the eroding elect uh, the electrodes deposit on the gas Reduce light output causing uh, spam and is uh, spam and zero drift. Metal to glass interface is prone to failure. <coughs> Excuse me. And also high power consu uh, consumption and high RFI can basically uh, hurt a PID. In the 1960s, valve electronics high power consumption. Several wattage lamps wasted energy as heat required large battery sources. Again, this is what the lamp looks like, but it's upside down. 
uh, for a purpose. Uh, the high power consumption uh, subject to RFI, the high frequency energy uh, effects by radio power lines, that's like if you're clicking a radio next to it, uh, higher maintenance, uh, the RF uh, radio frequency interface, coupling <coughs> efficiency requires perfectly tuned driver circuits. Um, so these are these are what usually excite a PID lamp. Again, here's high power uh, consumption with uh, PID lamp. So what what happens with the the it, the PID is extremely low in power and draw. It is a cool lamp. It has and it uses small battery. There's no internal contamination. The external uh, externally excites it with no metal uh, for them to damage or erode the mic or migrate. So as you can see by this picture, it's different from the last picture I showed you where there was a lot of interference with metals or particulates. In this particular example here, it talks about how the lamp is, is actually cradled inside the monitor and there's no cross-contamination <clears throat> with metal or any other ways of, of eroding the lamp. We'll pass that up to you. I want you to focus on this page, the, the welded seal to glass, uh, welded glass to glass seal. It's laser welded, extremely strong. It's rugged, has a high mechanical strength. In other words, you can shake it, you can drop it. I mean, to an extent, drop it. But it should, it should be able to handle the, uh, the abuse. It matched thermal expansion, so it's going to stay contained. It has low leakage and longer operating life. In other words, you're going to get anywhere from one to two years, even three years with our um, our half inch lamp on our mini ray 3000. This is what the, the, the picture this picture shows basically a little bit more technical drawing of what I showed you in slide three or four, talking about slow response time. Um, when you have a high sample volume, the light has further to travel. Uh, high, uh, high bias voltage requires more power. <clears throat> Slow recovery time, this is important because when you get a high hit with uh, a PID, um, you'll notice PIDs take a little bit longer to get down to, you know, let's say it shoots up to 560, then, it should, then you take it out of the environment, goes to 360, 280, 160, 80, <clears throat> 50.5, 10, 9. 1.1, then it goes to 0.8, and then it sits and hovers. Um, so it's really important for you to take your PID, if you're choosing a PID, is to expose it. Expose it to VOCs, and then monitor how long it takes to get back to zero. It's important for you to understand about humidity. <clears throat> humidity is a very bad thing for PID. It doesn't matter what brand it has. Ray Systems has what's called a uh, temperature and humidity compensation sensor. So in the likely case that you have something that's over 30 or 40 percent humidity, um, it should be able to compensate for it, but it's not exactly going to be 100 percent. The plus or minus error rate for a PID sample was as high back in the day, it was as high as 30 percent. Now we've narrowed it down to under 10 percent. So the laminar flow, the faster response is less than 3.2 seconds to a T90 or 90%. Reduced sensor chamber volume with low bias voltage, which you know which requires less power. Faster recovery, we talked about that in the last slide. The thing that makes our system a little bit simpler is because it, it quickly becomes, it quickly gets to zero. And there's actually, if you change a uh, PID in our monitor, there's an O-ring seal on the lamp chamber, so it allows the gas to flow through the chamber and not uh, and not flow freely within the meter itself, causing a false positive. <clears throat> linearity, it's very important to understand what linearity means. It's the fast response and recovery. Okay. So less than three uh, less than three seconds to a T90 up to 10,000. Actually in the mini rate 3000, it's it's 15,000. Lowest humidity response prevents dirt from uh, shorting out the sensor and simple lamp and sensor cleaning. So the higher the reading gets, like if you get over 9,000 or 10,000, 
If you have that XY graph, you see the Z axis on it, it actually will start to expand outward. And what that means, that's called linearity. We try to keep it, we try to keep it as close as possible with not only a two-stage calibration, which would be your fresh air calibrate, and then you would have something for the low end, but you also would use a high end. In other words, in the Mini Ray 3000, you do a fresh air calibrate. You would calibrate to, let's say in this case, it would be 100 parts per million, and then you can get a bottle of 1,000 parts per million, so it protects that linearity between 100 and 1,000 and tries to keep that linearity very, very close to 100%, over 1,000, up to 15,000 parts per million. The closer the, in this, in this diagram, you'll see the car, the closer, uh, closer to the headlights, the closer to the headlights, the easier it is to see something through the fog. By reducing the distance, the, v, the UV light travels in a PID, the effects of the humidity are drastically reduced. So it's just like driving with your car on a, on, a, on a foggy night. You turn on your lights and then you can see, but you can only see maybe 10, 15 feet in front of you. Then you put your brights on and you can't see anything in front of you. So <clears throat> the effects of humidity are very similar to that. That's why I included this in the slide. When using a PID, it doesn't matter what manufacturer, do not use Tigon tubing. If you go back to your gas monitor right now and you see your tubing, see how it's clear in the picture there? And it's like a milky yellow color. That Tigon tubing has been super saturated with VOCs and can lead to a false positive. So it's very important that you always use Teflon hosing when you're using a PID, even a four gas with PID, because you're gonna throw off that PID and give yourself a false positive. That Tigon tubing is gonna absorb it like a sponge. Again, false positives. When you use Tigon tubing, it will not absorb the chemicals, you know, as it gets coated. So it's very important. If you want to keep your hose, you just clean it with anhydrous methanol if it gets dirty. PID drip is due to poor sampling techniques. Um, sometimes people will suck up liquids and vapors in the probe. Um, this happens usually, especially in the fall or during the winter time. If you're outside doing investigations, like around creeks. Uh, ponds, or if you're on site, sometimes people will actually, um, they lose their depth perception because it's getting dark, and they'll actually drown their PID. They'll uh, put the tip in the water, or they'll actually accidentally hit it with uh, the chemical, and that chemical actually stays in the filter and gives you a full positive. So touching contaminant surfaces with probes is very bad. If you do do that, take the unit out of service and clean it with the uh, cleaning solution that comes with your PID. When cleaning the PID, <clears throat> when to clean a PID is usually when the display creeps upward after a good zero. So let's say, for instance, you zero out your monitor. I'm sorry, you turn on your monitor and it's reading 3.8, 4.2, 2.9, it's bouncing around. So your first instinct is you're gonna wanna, you're gonna wanna zero it out. So you do a fresher, a good fresher zero, and then all of a sudden, 20 seconds later, it goes to 1.5, 0.8, 2.2, drifting around, it's jumping around. Chances are your probe is dirty. When the PI responds to moisture, so usually what people will do is they'll actually clamp their hands around the end of the PID and let the moisture from your hand get sucked in through the PID. That also will tell you that you have microscopic dirt inside your PID that needs to be cleaned. Now, how to clean a PID sensor is really simple. <clears throat> um, chances are, I would change your filters first. If your PID holds a stable zero after this step, then, then there's no cleaning necessary. But you can use, you can use isopropanol alcohol and, not, and hydrous methanol alcohol to clean the lamp itself. You just basically would, would get like a tumbler uh, or a drinking glass. You would fill it up with uh, the solution take the sensor out, submerge it, and shake it around for about 10, 15 seconds. Do not use air or compressed air to, you know, sh sh shoot at it. So it's important for you to understand, let it air dry overnight, <clears throat> come back next morning, calibrate, you know, reassemble it, calibrate the instrument, you should be good to go. Okay, 
uh, with that. Um, if anybody has any questions, I'd be glad to help out. I apologize for my voice, but thank you very much for your patience. And uh, uh, I had a great time talking PID. And hopefully, uh, if you have any questions, certainly you can call the folks here at Rayco Rent. And uh, uh, they're a great partner with us, as well as uh, if they're not your safety partner, then uh, I would contact your safety officials and uh, see if you can get more information regarding PIDs. All right, Tom, thank you for the presentation. If you have any uh, specific application questions, I see some are coming in now. We'll go through those here in a minute. Um, you can also give us a call. Uh, our phone number here is 866-RENT-EHS. So 866-736-8347. Or you can always email me, matt at recorents.com. If you want to know more about our technologies we supply, please follow us on social media. We put out lots of good technical tips on our blog. You can also follow us on LinkedIn and Twitter. We do record all these training sessions. They'll be up uh, on our website in the training area um, in the next day or two. Um, so they are, they are posted up on YouTube. Um, if there are some uh, topics you'd like us to cover in our webinars, please email me with the subject. We have lots of product and process specialists. Please let me know what you'd like to cover. Email me again at matt at rickorents.com. All right, we'll go through some of these questions. Um, versus are there known interferences when using a PID? There's two particular interferences that I'm familiar with. One is free of frequency interference. Uh, second one would be humidity, uh, high temperature, very low temperature and humidity, uh, as well as one thing that I didn't talk about during the presentation were mixtures. So if you have a mixture, of, like in this case with MMA and acetone, the customer is going to ask, well, which one is it seen? And the answer is yes. <laughs> if they will see both of them. So if you do try to measure, like say you stick your probe or your sample probe inside that container, it's going to be hopping around because that particular explosion is happening at that particular moment. But if you, if you compare the two, uh, I would go to the electronic voltages of both of them. In this case, acetone is 9.6. Uh, let's see, MMA is, my trusty book right here, uh, is 9.7, and I think acetone is 9.2, if I remember right, 9.70. So I would probably say it's really a wash. It's a, to it's a toss up. So if you're having mixtures, especially in this particular situation, which was really sticky, uh, you would leave it at isobutylene units and you would lower your alarm limits to. Uh, and I would use the guideline as the, uh, the PEL or the uh, PWAs as the low and the high. Let's see. Um, the difference between an FID and a PID has come up. Which, yes. Which is better for what? Well, technically speaking, I, I sell PIDs. Um, uh, historically speaking, a PID is a poor man's FID. So uh, flame. Uh, Flame ionization detector uses a, a source, which in this case would be uh, hydrogen. Hydrogen inside, and so it, when it burns the, the unit, when it when it burns the sa sample coming through, it measures the temperature of the, the light in the sample. Uh, the PID just ionizes it, just ionizes it through. So in the case that I said earlier about taking a sample and putting a tedler bag and having a third party look at it. A PID would be better for it, whereas an FID will actually burn it, consumes it. Okay. Uh, let's see. For the calibration, is it relevant to use inert tubing instead of Tigon? I would rather I would rather use uh, Teflon tubing. Uh, it, it doesn't matter if your it doesn't matter if your tube is one foot long. Uh, Teflon tubing is going to be so much better than Tigon because in theory, Tigon tubing is going to absorb the uh, the gas for the isobutylene. So, not to split hairs, but it can actually uh, it'll absorb it, and it doesn't release it very well. And I think you know contaminating it with you know with the Tigon tubing is just not it wouldn't be precise. Someone asked uh, when renting, do we clean the PIDs before releasing? Uh, we do clean the PIDs here. Um, we you know, watch the drift as Tom talked about, and uh, 
and also RACO Red sends their employees to RAID systems training uh, once a year so that they are current and up to date on the latest with PIDs and maintenance. Now, I've had multiple questions about the slide deck. We will make that available online as well as the uh, rebroadcast of the video. Um, you discussed upward drift. What about negative drift? If you have negative drift with a PID, that chances are you zero calibrated it in a positive environment. So let's say, for instance, you were in, an, in that acetone unit that I was talking about earlier. Um, sometimes what will happen is, let's say you have a background of 2.0, and then what happens is you zero it, and now you're in a positive environment, then you step outside, it drops, and all of a sudden your monitor goes into alarm, and the display will say NEG or NEG or negative. That's, that's when you're really going to see what happens when you either pressure calibrate or when you calibrate an instrument in a positive environment. Okay, do you have a chemical list with IPs for each? I think there was a tech note from Ray. <coughs> tech note. Right. If you, if you go to Rayco Rent and uh, you email us at um, Matt at RaycoRents.com. I can send it to you um, in electronic form. Yeah, and I think we, if, even if you Google search this Techno 106, that, that comes up from Ray Systems. If you um, purchase, if you purchase a Ray Systems monitor or even rent it, we even have a poster which also is color coded and uh, it's easy to read. And we we tell people to use Techno 106 and the, and the poster as a guide. And as I understand, that is uh, specific to Ray. These have all been tested on Ray equipment. Yeah. So I've seen competitors will actually cover the Ray logo and put their logo over it, but it's our type. Okay. Um, that's okay. But they're not necessarily one for one, are they? But they're not necessarily one. In that case, you would use it as a guide only. You you, you right. cannot say like like for instance on Technet 106 for ammonia, it says 9.7 as a correction factor with 10.6 lamp. But if you use a let's pick on Ray systems multi ray it has a quarter inch lamp. It takes longer to ionize. The correction factor is 32.2. So you're going to be waiting. You're going to be waiting a couple more seconds for it to hit 32.2 before the unit says one. If you change it to a moment. Okay. What's the uh, frequency of calibration? We usually tell people bump before you choose, calibrate every 30 days. If they have a standalone PID especially with a rate systems monitor, it will hold its calibration very steadily. So I would probably say once every once every month, once every two months. If you have a four gas with PID, I probably would stick on a schedule of four to six weeks. Uh, are there training videos on how to use a PPB ray? A PPB ray is used the same way as the as the uh, mini ray 3000, but instead of reading in parts per uh, parts per million, you're reading in parts per billion. So the, the maintenance, the parts, the lamps, everything is the same. The button sequence, how you view the monitor is the same. It's just that you are measuring in parts per billion. Uh, what lamp should I use for measuring chlorinated VOCs such as TCE? Um, it'd be good to look on the tech note. The tech notes will tell you. We can, we can look at it really quick. Uh, how easy is it to change out a lamp on a PID? It's pretty easy. Um, just, you know, you want to wear rubber gloves. You don't want to touch the lamp with your fingertips. You have to treat the lamp. You have to, you have to treat the lamp like it's a high halogen bulb. So uh, each PID comes with finger cocks, uh, or else if you could put uh, gloves on, and you would handle it like it's a halogen bulb on your car. And uh, I would also use, when you're cleaning it, Make sure you use a Q-tip that is a uh, a non what's that called? It's uh, it, it doesn't fuzz like a normal Q-tip that you would have. Mm -hmm. So it, there are there are special Q-tips that come with each monitor as well. That and you, when you clean it, you don't clean it. Uh, you clean it like a CD. You clean it in circles, like you circular you know circular motion. You do not wipe it back and forth. Good enough. Uh, uh, about the question about the TEC, that's trichloroethylene. Its correction factor for a 10.6 lamp is 0.45, and its EV is 9.47, which would be uh, a, a good candidate for a PID. Uh, just keep 
keep in mind the TWA for that particular VOC is 50 parts per million. So in this case, you really want to focus on your low alarms uh, because the standard lamp, I'm sorry, the standard monitor probably has low as a 50 and 100 as the high. I would probably reduce it, talk to your safety professional, and probably reduce it down to maybe 50, and, I'm sorry, maybe 25 and 40 at the low and the high because you want to stay below that, that TWA. Um, somebody's asking about continuing education points. We don't have our uh, webinar certified, although I know people have uh, submitted to their uh, the organization and uh, and have had them approved. So um, we suggest you take the, uh, the the slide deck and then the uh, descriptions and and submit. Um, We'd be glad to answer any questions that you might have, as well as. Uh, Honeywell does have training in Lincolnshire here in the Chicago area. Uh, sometimes we have education services like how to use a PID, what application, how would you use this app for this PID. If anything like that happens, we can certainly put it up on the website, on Rayco's website. Okay. And what are the hazmat dangerous goods shipping issues for FIDs and PIDs? Um, the PID, the only hazmat shipping issue I can think of is if it's got a lithium ion battery in it. Uh, those all need to be labeled. Um, the FID, um, there is a hydrogen cylinder. They should be shipped empty uh, and filled uh, when you receive them. Um, some of the newer ones are starting to use hydrogen fuel cells uh, that can be shipped uh, labeled properly. Um, I think the labeling is what, a 3481? I don't recall the number. So with a PID, you would have your lithium ion battery. As long as it's installed, it's still safe. But if you have a cylinder of isobutylene inside there, you have to be registered with the DOT or you have to have a license to do the hazmat shipping. Yeah, to do the hazmat shipping. So, um, and then the classification, I think, is a 3481. So, so I hope that answers that question. Uh, is there a significant difference in calibrating with 10 parts per million ISO versus 100 parts per million? This is a great question. Um, a lot of people will say, well, wait a second, you know, what's the accuracy of a PID? And I say 10%. And they're saying, well, wait a minute. If I'm reading 100, is it 110 or is it 90? This is, if you are involved in low readings with a PID, I would strongly recommend that you change your calibration gas to 10 parts per million. So you sharpen the pencil on the low end of the scale, but however, on the high end of the scale, you might have that linearity separation. That's why you would do a three-point calibration. You do fresh air, the 10 ppm, then the 100 ppm. So for, I'd say in, in this area, in the Midwest, I would probably say 85% of the users will use 100 ppm because they feel that the 10% plus or minus error rate is satisfactory. But there are some people out there that want that sharp pencil. And they would change the calibration gas to make it more sensitive on the low end scale, which is the 10 parts per million. Does altitude affect the PID? Um, so said, yes, because if I if I calibrate a monitor here in Chicago and I send it to Denver, it's going to read differently. It, it could drift because of the pressure. So your best bet is when you receive uh, a PID from any any manufacturer, if it comes from Texas or Connecticut or California, that when you go to a higher altitude location like North Dakota, uh, Colorado, Wyoming. Uh, immediately calibrated again, even though it has passed calibration, you just want it to be acclimated to that environment. Let's see. Is there a negative to calibrating before each use? My understanding has been, I think that's it. My understanding has been that unsaturated chlorinated hydrocarbons are measured with less sensitivity than aromatics. If the unit is calibrated with isobutylene, and contaminate and contaminant is perchloroethylene. Why? Hmm. Perchloroethylene? I'm not sure I understand. Well, first of all, when you cal it doesn't matter how often you calibrate a monitor, a PID is a non any manufacturer, it's a non consuming sensor. So you're not going to burn it out. So if you expose an LEL sensor to too much methane, let's say twenty percent methane, if you don't if you hold it on if you hold methane on that 20% methane on an LEL sensor for more than three to five seconds, I mean, you're going to burn that sensor out like nothing. 
but a PID will not burn out because it's time consuming. So the the trichloroethylene, is that what you said? Perchloroethylene. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's perch. The unit is calibrated with isobutylene and contaminant is perchloroethylene, that's P E C. Uh, its correction factor is 9.32. The correction factor on 10.6 is, uh, is 5.57. Oh, wait, I didn't finish the question. Why? Uh, if the unit is calibrated with isobutylene and the contaminant is perchloroethylene, why would CF be 0.57? PID display says 100 times 0.57 is 57 parts per million. That's correct. But if response to PCE is less sensitive, I was taught the 100 part per million display is an underestimation of the actual value, i.e. not 57 parts per million, but actual concentration of PPE would be higher than 100. It would be higher than 100 in isobutylene scale, but if you change to, if you change to PEC, uh, then he would be looking at, that's why he would come with a 57. However, um, you know, he, I'm not sure if he's figuring in the 10% error rate for PID as well. Right. So some of these some of the PIDs have correction factors built into them. Um, I know, I don't know if your, yours does. Right? <laughs> yeah, it, yeah. Has, it has over 300 uh, inside it. And you can also have, let's say for instance, you have a new VOC and it's not in the library. You can actually customize it with the software and put that particular VOC and the correction factor into the monitor and put it in your like my favorites list on the on the PID. So you calibrate with isobutylene and then you can set the instrument for what you're looking for and it would automatically apply the correction factor. Absolutely. And if you're changing from room to room, you can do uh, my last 10, or you can go to the library and just go put the book down and then you can highlight that one and then it changes the correction factor immediately. How long should I let the unit run before calibration? That's a good question. Um, I would probably let it run for about two to three minutes, let it warm up, uh, let the lamp warm up, let the monitor warm up, and then it'll stabilize, and then go ahead and do your calibration. A lot of guys are quick to the draw, and they turn it on, and they immediately put it in calibration mode. Um, let the meter wake up a little bit, so just wait about two or three minutes. All right, a couple more questions. Can you talk a little bit about bump testing? Bump testing is you're taking a known sample gas, let's say for instance 100 ppm of, cal of isobutylene calibration gas. So what you do is you're gonna, you're gonna actually sit there and you're going to put the 100 ppm on there, probably under 10 seconds, no more than 12 seconds, it should reach within 10% of the numeric information on the side of the bottle. So if Within 10 to 12 seconds, no more than 15 seconds, it hits 90 to 105, 110. You got a good working monitor. It's that's that's considered a bump test. And last one I have here is how often should the filters need to be replaced? The filters are clear for a reason. Uh, I've seen filters come back from monitors from uh, demonstrations where they're absolutely filthy. So I would probably, you know, get on some type of a schedule change of maybe once a month. Or take a look at the top of the uh, of the filter, and if you start to see dark dirt particles or it's changing colors compared to the underside of the filter, filters are cheap, and they are the last resort of holding anything back. So as we talked about, dirt and debris is bad for PIDs. So is water. Water and electronics don't mix. So that water trap is a hydrophobic filter. So it will swell if water comes into the line as well as dust and dirt debris will be at your last line of defense against the monitor. All right, that'll conclude the presentation. Appreciate everybody joining us. All right. Thank you very much, everyone. Yep. Have a great day. Stay safe.